Welcome back, I'm Tedward, and welcome back to my 2023 Honda Civic Type R, the FL5, my daily driver now with over 12,000 miles. And this is going to be my ownership update video. This is supposed to be a 10,000 mile update video, but I drive a lot. I've been too busy filming other people's cars that I haven't been able to film my own. So how has it held up? So let's start with the exterior, we'll work our way in. I bought this car last year in December and I daily drove it immediately. I traded my Honda Civic Si for this the moment it arrived and I was very happy. Although getting a new car in the winter in New England is not the greatest feeling in the world because you immediately start subjecting it to salt and snow and potholes and frost heaves and all the ugliness of the rust belt, which isn't good. But one of the things I did to protect it was we had craft detailing first go through the whole car, do a little paint correction, and then put on PPF paint protection film from here forward. So everything from here forward has a layer of paint protection film on it, which has done wonders to keep the car from getting tons of rock chips. Because look, I didn't wash this car for this video. I wanna show you like the reality of the situation. All this little stuff right here, like that's actually a little bit of an abrasion on the PPF, but it's protected the paint and I think that is the goal here is so that way if I do go to resell this car at some point it won't need to be like repainted and have all those little chips done up but not only that it's saving me a little bit of money because these headlights are protected as well and I think that is a really expensive thing to have shatter on you and if you have even just the smallest little layer to help you with that it does the job and, and I don't wanna to have to be replacing headlights on this thing. Nor do I wanna replace any body panels on this car because they're pretty much all bespoke to the Type R save for, I believe, this door and this roof. Everything else, or maybe the hatch, I forget too. But either way, and I was actually really nervous that this was gonna pick up a ton of rock chips. They do from the factory, you can see the dirt line on this. Put a little bit of paint protection foam right here. But honestly, this is all held up really well. It is just filthy, I promise. This is not scratches or anything. The car is really, really clean. Except there is one section that I did get a big old rock chip and I heard it. It's right here. So I had a low rock come off and I thought, I swear, when I heard this hit, I thought it shattered my windshield. But no, it was just that big old rock chip. So I'm gonna have to have that uh, touched up because I don't want that to start to rust. That's not where we wanna be. But overall, exterior of the vehicle. It's wide, it's not that hard to park, and over the past 12,000 miles, I've really enjoyed driving this on the highway because its wide stance translates also onto the road. It feels wider, more muscular and rigid on the highway than does the typical 11th generation Civic, the Touring, or even the SI. So overall, I'm really happy with that. These black wheels, boy oh boy, are these some dusty pads. Yes, they do get super dusty. These are carbon, uh, uh, sorry, these are ceramic coated as well. But you can, you, these, when this car is clean, man, oh man, does it clean up nicely. But like I said, I'm driving this quite a bit, so I'm not always that attentive to keeping it pristine. Now, let's get around back because this has so much room and I am like a traveling film studio <laughs> and I always go for runs. So I keep accumulating hats. It's pretty rough. I've got tripods. I've got cue cards. I've got all the things that I need to get my normal filming done through the day. Not my cue cards. It's for another job that I've been working on on the side freelance. But anyway, I can fit so much stuff in this car. There's never been a moment where I haven't been able to fit what I need in this vehicle. And in fact, I've never actually needed to uh, put these rear seats down unless I'm transporting wheels. It's the only time I've ever done that. But with my normal day-to-day -day stuff, never need to put those down. And what I love about it is that even if I've got a bunch of expensive film equipment in the car, which I, I really almost never, ever, ever leave in the car, but sometimes you just gotta park or go to a rest stop and you gotta pee on a long drive. Um, it's really nice to have this here because then I can hide everything. So despite being a hatchback, it still does a really good job of ensuring that there's privacy and that I'm not allowing the, the, the goods to be shown. Here's the thing, we're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly today because that's all the exterior stuff. You know, pretty standard. You take care of the car, it takes care of you. You wash it once in a while, you know, we're good to go. Inside, if you remember, around 4,000 miles, this seat 
boy, oh boy, did this start squeaking. And it coincided with the recall. So the recall came out and said, hey, there's an issue with these seats. Um, they could come loose. And then very shortly after, mine started creaking around like I think 4,000 miles. The recall happened. We got the seat redone. That was nice. They just put some washers in and stuff and they redo the bracket, I guess. And it has been rock solid, completely silent. My only gripe with this, my only gripe is that when they did the seat, you know, they take the seat out and they put it back in. I think they scratched the heck out of this. And like, I don't know, that just annoys me. And this is where, yes, it's just a Civic. It's just a Civic. It's just a Civic. But like, it's my Civic. <laughs> and I love this car. And that kind of annoyed me. But again, because it's quote, just a Civic, this isn't like my paint to sample GT3 Touring. Those are things that I can live with. Honestly, I think it's better that that happened for me personally, because when you get like a couple little cosmetic scuffs that aren't going to like rust on the paint or anything like that, you can relax about the vehicle just a little bit more. Now I run weather techs in this vehicle at all times because these red carpets, boy, oh boy, what a shame to get those filthy. I mean, look, look, I need to go through and I really need to go and do like a little interior detail on this, but like, no joke, I'm showing you this car this way because I live in it. I live out of this car. I drive it every single day. This is not some little garage queen type R. I did not buy this to resell it. I did not buy this to show off to anybody. In fact, I barely bought this to go to the racetrack which is kind of a damn shame i need i need to bring this to the racetrack but here's the thing it's functionality it's the beauty of the type r is the fact that it is quote just an 11th gen civic in so many ways that's the best thing is that it's like a really great sports car built on a fairly reasonably priced econo car base and for that we get the benefits of like ultra reliable stuff. We get the benefits of really simple, easy to use things that aren't overly complicated. I don't have even heated seats, which is annoying and I wish it did, but I don't have to worry about like certain things breaking because there's not enough technology in this vehicle to, to break. There's not even a sunroof in this thing to allow for leaking inside uh, uh, those little weep holes and all that stuff. So that's great. I, I, I appreciate that about this Type R and I appreciate that it's differentiated enough with its body and some of the little styling cues that it's obviously cooler than a standard Civic. But look, there are some problems. I have had some issues and it mostly focuses on this infotainment system. Now it works most of the time. It does. It works most of the time. But when it doesn't work, when it doesn't connect to my phone, when it doesn't allow me to do certain things, it is infuriating. Here is a little rant I went on with this because I found some nuances to it as well. Apple CarPlay has been kind of a mess in this car lately. This whole display has been really laggy. Sometimes I start it and it's just black for a really long time, but this should work. If you're gonna put a big screen in the middle of the car, it needs to work. And here's the deal. I've plugged it in, I've unplugged it, but watch this, right? I've got this going. It's playing on the phone. It's not playing on the car. When I make a phone call, here, watch this. We'll make a phone call. Uh, yeah, all right, it's on iPhone, I'll put it on CarPlay. Hello, hello? Hello, hello. Okay, but now it's not playing through all the speakers in the car, it's actually only playing through this speaker back here, which is very frustrating. Dana, keep talking to me for a second. Tell me your, your favorite car. Okay, so that's volume all the way up and that's all I'm hearing out of this. So now let's get out, go for a little drive. We'll talk more about the driving experience and how this is to live with on the road as a car because, you know, we can go through the whole thing. You understand what it is, but like, is it a comfortable daily driver? Is it the daily driver I actually want to continue daily driving? Or was this a giant expensive mistake? So it's the next morning and you can join me on my morning commute and see how it drives. It's getting pretty cold out here. It's 35, 36 degrees in New England. It's definitely about time to get onto the Blizzax. 
these PS4S's are good to about like high 40s around 50 degrees and that's when they start to really break away quickly and they start getting slippery. Now they're still a good like reasonable tire but they're not an all season. And look, my phone. It, 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 it's immediately coming back together. Everything's working. It's doing wireless CarPlay like immediately. That's good news. And I don't want you to think that like it never works. It works most of the time. The problem is when it doesn't work, it's super frustrating because it works most of the time. Anyway, this two liter is a small little engine. There's not a whole lot of oil in it. So it warms up pretty darn quick, but it doesn't warm up as quickly as my SI did. I had that 1.5 liter turbo in my Civic SI and that man, oh, by the time I got out of my neighborhood, the thing was pretty much blowing warm air. This is not, it's not as bad as like my V8 M3 where you basically need to be on the highway for a while before you get any warm puffs of air coming through here. But it definitely takes a little bit longer. Not a, not, in no way am I saying like these are deal breakers or anything like that. I'm just giving you the lowdown of what it is like to own. Going into reverse, this is not a great camera. It's an okay camera. It does the job. And a lot of times, even if that rear glass is super filthy and gross and I don't wanna give it a wipe because maybe I don't wanna scratch the glass, this camera is usually clean and it shows a wide enough field of view that I really appreciate the visibility because you really don't have that much visibility looking over the shoulder, but you can't see anything that's short. So the other thing this camera does pretty well is that it will give side detection. So if someone was coming up or down the street, it would go beep, 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 because it detects motion coming from uh, both directions, which is really helpful in parking lots because sometimes you're backing out of a tight space. Look, we live in a world where everyone drives a giant SUV and when you're able to do this and you can see kind of around those cars a little bit, man, does that give you an edge in not getting rear-ended because I bet this is a tough bumper to replace in today's supply chain market. The shift knob is awesome, but it's very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. Um, even on a cold transmission though, this shifter feels pretty darn good. Sometimes you get into a car in the cold and it shifts a heck of a lot worse, especially like this one too, ready? You gotta be a little patient with it, but I've been in cars even with very, very low miles and fresh synchros and all that good stuff and they're not happy in the cold. This car does pretty well in the cold. It's very happy and I I don't really worry about it because one reason that I've always like liked driving an automatic car in the winter is for that reason. It's, it's, it's frustrating when you're like, ooh, every time I leave my neighborhood, it's a double clutch to third or it crunches, even if I'm super gentle. It's just, it takes a little bit of the joy out of it because especially if you wake up tired and the first thing you do is like at that jarring, like, oh, it's just not a good way to wake up. The fuel economy that I have experienced in this car over the past, oh, look at this little Veloster N guy, hey. Um, the fuel economy that I have encountered a GX. Okay, we're gonna be talking about Lexus GXs in a minute too because I really want a winter daily. That'll tie in in a minute. Fuel economy. Over the past 12,200 miles, I have achieved 29.1 miles per gallon. That is pretty good. Now the problem is that I owned a Civic Si for 13,000 miles before I bought this. Coming from a V8 M3 getting around 20, going to the Si, Whoa, I went from like 20 miles per gallon to like 41 miles per gallon in that car. That was nuts. And holy, oh man, what a what an experience. What like an eye-opening experience to like fuel efficiency. And then going from SI to this, it did feel like a concession, but I think that's just such an unfair assessment because in any other circumstance, 29.1 mile per gallon average, very, very, very good. Look at what most people drive. I was talking about SUVs a little while ago. Everybody drives some big old truck getting like 20, to like maybe 20, lucky if they get 25 MPG. That's, that's the odd world we live in where for whatever reason, regulations are through the roof about fuel economy, yet everyone drives some like gas guzzling SUV. It makes no sense to me. I, 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 this is like mind blowing because even, even a lot of hybrid SUVs don't get actually good fuel economy. But this at about 30 miles per gallon for how fun this is, I am 
quite satisfied, quite happy. The problem is this fuel tank is only like 12 gallons. 12 gallons is not a lot. And I do find myself at the gas station all the time. I wish this had more like a 400 mile range where it's really closer to 300. Not the worst thing in the world and it doesn't cost that much to fill it because it's only 12 gallons, but it would be nice if I didn't have to go to the gas station all the time. I would love like a 15 or 16 gallon tank. That would have been like a real joy, but I also understand that that's a packaging issue and a weight issue and all, all kinds of stuff. It's just not in the cards, but cars today have such tiny little fuel tanks. My 88 911 has like a 20 gallon tank in, in 1988, a little tiny 911. And this has 11. So, you know, that's just one of those like weird little hidden things that has changed over time is the fuel tanks keep getting smaller. And I'm wondering, I do wonder if that's like for the illusion of cheaper gas. Like, is it is it the OEMs trying to make you feel like you don't spend as much at the pump because you only have to put 11 gallons into it? Huh, I wonder. Out here on some open highway, this car really does shine as a commuter. Now, it's a little loud. There's some exterior road noise that comes into play, but I have to give so many props to Honda for this solid construction. Interior-wise, there are no squeaks and rattles. When this seat was rattling before I had the recall taken care of, man oh man was it apparent because there was nothing else that made a noise in the car. And I go over some pretty harsh roads on a 19 inch wheel with not a whole lot of sidewall. So if this car were to manifest a bunch of rattles, I would have assumed it was going to happen already. And it hasn't. So you're getting really crazy build quality. The other thing is that the seating position in this vehicle is impeccable. It's so good. I'm nice and low in the in the chair. And the chair is incredibly comfortable and supportive. Those are two things that don't always mix so well. Sometimes a really supportive seat laterally is gonna be really rough and uncomfortable. And these seats, these very famously red seats, are perfect for the job. Not to mention that my knees never, ever, ever come near that steering column, which is something that I forget about until I get into almost any other car. If I got into a Volkswagen, for example, I, I feel like I always nail my knee on the steering column. I'm not a big guy, so why am I hitting my knees on the steering column? It's just bonkers, that should never happen, and Honda does a great job of making this a comfortable and usable place to drive. Sometimes car companies seem to forget that like driving is the point of being in the car and if you can't manipulate your legs to move around comfortably, then it's really awkward and then you're like moving around the steering wheel around that steering column as if I'm driving some like 1960s Ferrari, which by the way, less charming than you'd think. <laughs> The auto rev match, you can say that I'm a little baby, I'm a little baby for using it, but for daily driving a manual transmission and wanting to maintain like the ultra longevity of the of the wear items of this car, I find it to be really useful. I think it takes away a lot of stress and if you wanna go and, and bomb some fun back roads and do all the work yourself, you can absolutely go in and change that. I wish they made a button. I wish there was just an auto rev match button instead of having to go through like four menus to get to that feature. And by the way, you can't do it while you're driving. You can only do it when you're at a stop. Kind of annoying, but I think, it, and it's a great system, it works really well. I've used others, even, I, I, frankly, I don't even think Porsche has as good a rev match system as, as Honda right now. So again, like Honda really spending the time on making their features and, and ergonomics fantastically good. Fantastically good in an Econo car. So a couple things you can glean from that acceleration. Number one, a little bit of turbo lag. I wasn't getting into it hard, 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 and I'm not gonna go like power shifting my car every time I go off a light. Number two, a little bit of wheel hop. This is a very hoppy car, especially when it's a little chilly out. It's 36 degrees. Yes, we've been driving on the highway for a little bit and the tires have a little bit of heat in them, but unless you're in like pretty warm conditions, uh, it's gonna wheel hop, but this, Differential does an incredible job of putting the power down most of the time. Now let's talk about the winter because it is getting cold and we are starting to hop our little wheels. Um, I 
have a set of Blizzax for this car, a completely different set of wheels and tires for the winter because you have to do that. You really do. This is pretty much not negotiable where I live in New England. You need to have some snow tires. Uh, and I'm definitely not gonna survive on a PS4S. But here's the problem. I don't love daily driving this car in the winter. I feel like I wanna preserve it and I'm in the wrong lane, but you know what I'm gonna do, guys? I'm gonna commit to my mistake. I'm not gonna cut that guy off. I'm gonna go right. <laughs> I'm early anyway, but I'm gonna go right because I always see, I hate it when people do this. It's like, oh, you got in the wrong lane. Well, that's not my problem. So this is my problem. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go where I I pointed. Um, I don't want to daily this car in the winter for two reasons. Number one, I feel like I'm stacking a ton of miles on the car, but you know what? As Jerry says, whoever goes to heaven and has the least miles on their Porsche loses, right? Like, sure, you should drive your things and enjoy them. I just don't know that I want to be like putting that many miles on this car. Uh, number two, I would love like an all wheel drive sort of SUV truck like thing anyway, because I've been having so much fun overlanding and I, I'm finding that to be a really charming endeavor. But, all right, now we'll just do like a minorly illegal U-turn. Turning radius, not the best on this thing. Um, it gets the job done, but like, yikes, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be doing like super duper tight things in this car. Okay, I want an SUV and I want something that can do like some light overlanding and I want something that I can just have ground clearance and have no concerns whatsoever about getting to my destination. There's pro a probable chance that I'm gonna be doing some like occasional commutes to, I just saw a beautiful Astura Blue uh, M, M Roadster, very cool. Okay, very distracted, I'm a squirrel. I'm gonna be doing some probable commutes to Buffalo, New York. Like Buffalo, New York, if you're not familiar with Buffalo, it's really snowy. It's like, it's like hella snowy. It's like a lake effect, like feet and feet and feet and feet like the shining snowy and the roads get really bad and like look I am I I have been the advocate for like you could drive rear wheel drive in the snow in my M3 as long as you have the right tires blah 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 there are <laughs> guys there's limits to that there are limits to like your safety and just like your confidence and comfort level when you're going it's one thing if you're like okay we're going out we're gonna go to do some drifties and stuff it's another thing it's like you're stuck in a snowstorm like would I rather be in an M3, a Civic Type R, or a Lexus GX460? And I gotta tell you, I'd rather be in the Lexus on some big old like Firestone, snowy, all-terrain type tires. That's that's where I would rather be. Um, and so that's what I'm looking at because I'm not so sure that I want to daily this in, in the winter. I'm not so sure that this needs to be my be all end all everything, everything, everything car. I would like to have something in truck form. That's fun. Look at all the snow plows. Yes. Forge gearing up for the plow season. We like that. And that's where I think like I would love to be able to retire this car every winter and just drive my big old Lexus um, with heated steering wheel, heated seats, all those kind of goodies. And I don't see that as a concession. I don't see that as like, oh, well, you wussed out and you couldn't do it. You couldn't hack it in the Honda. No, I, I see it as like, I want to live like a slightly more worry-free life. Also, I want to have a new experience without giving up the experience of this Honda. So if I do get a Lexus GX460, which please comment in, in, in below because I think the Lexus GX460 is one of the most insane cars on sale today. I know they're coming out with a new GX with a twin turbo V6 and the hybrid and everything, but like to get the 2023, the last of the run, the end of the run of a V8 Lexus that's basically been in production for like 20 years, yeah, anyway, back to the Honda. And as far as maintenance is concerned, all I've done are oil changes. I, they're included because the Honda Civic Type R has uh, like Honda Pass or whatever they call their maintenance schedule. So I haven't even had to pay for any of those. I just go to the dealership and 
they do it every 5,000 miles. So that's great too, because it shows up on the Carfax report. And uh, you know, when you're selling a car, uh, like if I'm buying a used car, it's really nice to be able to see like dealer oil changes from new, from the time of purchase versus just like hoping that they did it. Now it's a much easier oil change than my BMW was just because it's a heck of a lot less oil. That BMW took almost nine liters of oil. This is like five or 4.8 or something like that. Um, and so when I do eventually do these oil changes myself, it's gonna be cheap because it's not a whole lot of oil. It's zero W20. If I'm going to the track, I'll put five W30 in it just because <laughs> I don't really wanna be running water at the track. All right, let me make sure that I'm going the right direction. 93 North, good, good, good. Boston, not the hardest to navigate, but um, sometimes I'm just driving in locations that I don't often drive. And uh, you all make sure you're doing a good job. That's all. I just listened to a great podcast about the big dig and it's kind of fun when you're like driving through it and you're like oh yeah this is something that i use pretty regularly and even though it was looked at as a quote boondoggle and very very expensive it made the city better so <laughs> it was worth it i hope they spend the money on the on the on the public transportation system because our trains are a nightmare and honestly if we have better public transit that'll open up the roads a lot better because people will want to take trains and buses more than driving. This is such an easy commute right now because it's the right time of day, but like if it's the wrong time of day, this is such a nightmare. All right. Oh, these people are all doing the wrong thing for me. <laughs> Jump in over here. There we go. That little squiggle that you might be hearing in the back is not the car. There's like a poster board back there with a script on it because I'm doing this little freelance gig. So um, that's that, that's not the car. The car's not making any noise. In terms of ride comfort, I drive this car almost exclusively in comfort mode because it is a little too stiff in sport mode and in plus R mode. Now, I don't think that this car is too stiff. I mean, a lot of people, especially after the Acura Integra Type S came out, a lot of people said, oh, the Type R is too stiff. It's not a good daily driver. It's not a livable car. Like, I totally disagree. I think this car in comfort mode is like perfect. It's sporty, it's fun, it's responsive. I don't expect my Honda to be, what the heck is all that? I don't expect my Honda to be a luxury car. I don't expect it to be plush and supple and all those things. Like, I'm okay with this being a little bit stiff, but even then, it's not really stiffer than my BMW M3. So that's just gonna be a personal tolerance that you're gonna have to make a choice on if this is a car that you're considering. Here's the garden, here's the Zakem Bridge, beautiful stuff, we love it. Um, but, you know, for me at least, I don't find this to be too stiff or unbearable. And because they went from a 20 to a 19, from FKA to FL5, I haven't bent a wheel. I've had one flat tire and it's just because I picked up a nail. So, you know, in that regard, it's been pretty good. And I have like a wheel and tire package. So like, honestly, not that I'm hoping to get flat tires, but like, I would like to get my money's worth out of that, <laughs> out of that insurance policy if I can. Um, but I do, you know, there's no spare. So it is a hella inconvenience if, um, if that doesn't work out well. Let's see. Oh, that guy's really going for it. He's really picking his nose. And not that it's like a normal comparison, E92 M3 versus Civic Type R, but that's what I came from. And I do find that this car is just so much easier to drive as a daily driver, not only because of fuel economy, but because they have some torque. This little, this little turbo two liter is such a peach. And I don't have to dig so high up in the revs for power. The sound system on the Type R is pretty good. It's not great. I do like the Integra Type S. And it's funny because in Savage Geese's test, this apparently tests better than the Integra Type S. But like, as a human, I prefer the Integra Type S sound system. If it had that premium sound system, I think I'd be a little happier. In addition to that, like, this is somewhat of a noisy cabin. So if you're on like loud concrete roads, it doesn't always drown it out and 
you may be like, oh man, wouldn't that be nice if it was a little more luxurious? But then again, you're remembering, A, you're in a Civic, B, you're in like the raciest Civic. So who, who cares? And most of the things that I could complain about, I don't because any complaints would be against the purpose of this vehicle. So it really does set out to do exactly what it's supposed to do. I think the ride is appropriately stiff. I think the handling is fantastic. And despite being like a razor sharp little car, it's not hard to dial in on a long drive. You know, sometimes you get into like a really sporty car and it is a bear, a real bear to try and, and drive in a straight line for a long time because it's very darty and this doesn't really feel darty. But I can be confident in little moves like this which if you're in a big soft sedan, maybe doesn't feel that confidence inspiring. In addition to that, the Civic is a big car. This is pretty much the size of an Accord, man. So you've got all the room in the world. You don't feel like you're swimming amongst the whales as a little fish driving around in your sporty little Honda. No, you, you're a normal sized car out here. So that, that's a big point in its favor if you're gonna use this as a daily driver. So as I'm driving back home, you've driven, if you're from Massachusetts, you're watching this video, like where the heck did you go today? Yeah, I went kind of all over the place. In fact, we were just over there driving on that bridge. But um, yeah, man, it's been a long day. I've put a heck of a lot more miles on the car, which I like doing. I genuinely enjoy stacking miles on this thing. And do I feel a little bit guilty? Sure, a lot of my peers, especially like journalist peers who have purchased a Type R, they're not really putting that many miles on their cars. Maybe, I mean, I think Honda Pro Jason stacked a lot right off the bat. I don't know if he's still driving it all the time. But um, yeah, I mean, I bought this car because I thought, what's the coolest, most special thing that I could purchase, drive every day and afford to drive every day? I can't do this with the GT3. I don't think I could stomach the miles if I did this in a Porsche 911 GT3. I mean, I know we're talking about a completely different ball game, but that's the reality is where I thought, well, you know what? What if I buy the coolest Civic there is that is fun, that I like to drive, and that I can afford to depreciate. I can afford to, to, to put some miles on it and enjoy like a car. A lot of times we stretch ourselves way too thin. We buy something that we can barely afford. And then the reality is you can't really enjoy the thing because you're worried about, oh boy, where can I park it? Can I do this? Can I do that? I'm going to be a gentleman, man. You jump in here in your white E300. Yeah, there's room for you. There's room for you, buddy. Okay, you take that lane. That's cool. We'll all go together. Um, and I don't want to be in that position where... I, I have bought something so cool that I can't actually enjoy it because I can't afford <laughs> I can't afford to enjoy it. So with this Honda, I feel like it really allows me to enjoy the thing because the consumables are cheap. The car, although forty five thousand dollars, it's not nothing. It's not a hundred grand. I can't lose fifty thousand dollars on this car, you know. And that's a good feeling. It feels good to be driving something that I can afford to lose some of the money. So as I dive down into the depths, into the bowels of the city of Boston through the entryway of the big dig from the Zakem Bridge. That is gonna wrap my 12,000, more than 12,000 mile update on my Honda Civic Type R. And there's more to come, there's more to come. I, 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 it's funny, I thought I was gonna film so much more with this car recently. I just haven't because it is there's so many other cars I've been filming that I sometimes forget about the one car that I'm like, man, I think people really wanna hear about this and what it's like, and then it's easy not to film your own stuff. So thank you guys so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Don't forget to respect the drive, and I'll see you in the next one.